Hello everyone, we're back in section 9.3 of AP Statistics looking at significance testing for population mean. I didn't mean to leave you with a cliffhanger at the end of part one, but I knew we needed a little bit more time and thought this would be a good way to break it up. So here again we are with our table of data. Remember that we ran an experiment. We measured the self-reported depression level for people after they had been either two days with caffeine pills or without and with a placebo and deprived completely of any caffeinated beverages. Let's take a look at the situation. Why did researchers randomly assign the order in which subjects receive placebo and caffeine? You may have thought of this when you were reading the question, but basically the researchers want to be able to determine that the difference actually occurred from the difference in caffeine level compared with the perception of difference in caffeine level by the participants in the study. So if they didn't know which one they were getting, the placebo or the caffeine capsules, and the order was randomized, then truly the only difference that we would see in their depression level should be attributable to the difference in caffeine level. We're always concerned about the order of the treatments. This is why we randomize. Suppose that caffeine were given to all of the subjects during the first two-day period. What if the weather were nice on those two days and nicer than on the second two-day period when then they were all taking the placebo capsules? Researchers wouldn't be able to tell whether the difference in depression was because of the weather or because of the caffeine treatment. Random assignment of the caffeine and placebo of the two time periods in the experiment should help us make sure that there are no other variables like the weather that is affecting the response, the subject's responses to the depression questionnaire. Let's see what the test is going to look like. For state, if caffeine de deprivation has no effect on depression, then we would expect the actual mean difference in depression scores to be zero. So how are we actually going to put that in our hypothesis? Well, we're going to create a mu sub d, or population mean of the difference. And if there's no difference, which is going to be our status quo hypothesis, our null hypothesis, then if there's no difference, then that means the difference is zero. Our alternative hypothesis is that there is a positive difference, and if you remember the direction of the subtraction, that indicates we would have a greater depression level when subjects were taking the placebo. In this case, we all, and well, always, we indicate what our parameter of interest and our, our population of interest are. So this says where mu sub d is a true mean difference, placebo minus caffeine, in depression scores for subjects like these. And we choose the order of subtraction. We could have done it the other way, but because we're trying to find positive uh, reporting of depression, we chose it this way. No significance level was given to us in the question, so we're going to default to an alpha of 0.05. Next, we need our plan, and this is going to include our checking for conditions. So if conditions for inference are met, we will conduct a paired t-test for difference in population mean. We start with random. Researchers randomly assign the treatments, placebo then caffeine, or caffeine then placebo to the subjects. This is an example of a randomized experiment not random selection of subjects, randomized experiment. The 10% condition, we aren't actually sampling, so it is not necessary for us to check the 10% condition for use of the standard deviation equation that we're going to be plugging into our test statistic equation. The next condition is going to be our normal or large sample size condition. And we have no idea what the population distributions look like. We do know that our sample size with n equals 11 is too small for the central limit theorem to apply. So that means that we're going to need to graph our samples in order to see if it's safe for us to use t procedures. Remember that we're looking for strong skewness or outliers, and that would preclude us from using t procedures. So you can see that we graphed it three different ways. The histogram of the differences, the box plot of the differences, and the normal probability plot of the differences. We see from the box plot that we have no outliers. We see from the normal probability plot that we have a little bit of an S-curve going on. It's kind of linear, but kind of not. 
And in the histogram, we really don't see anything that, we do have skew, definitely have skew. And we can also see that in the box plot. We can also see that in the normal probability plot, but it's not strong enough for us to stop where we are and not continue the test. So we will continue on with the next part after we've checked conditions, and that is where we calculate our test statistic. Just a quick word about graphing. Remember that once we put the data into our list, we go to second y equals to access our statistical plots. And so all we need to do to graph all three of these very quickly is to change the graph type. And we're always gonna use a modified box plot. That's the one with the little dots on that right-hand side. All right, let's continue our test. Very important for us to sketch and shade, and because the data is already in our calculator, it's very easy for us to also run the t-test that we're going to be conducting in the calculator. That can be found under stat test, and then we're going to do a t-test, which I think on my calculator is option number two under test. We're going to select data because it's in our list. We're going to select our null hypothesis and the list where our data is stored, and then the direction of the alternative hypothesis. You'll notice down at the bottom that we have two options, calculate and draw. Draw is what gives us the graphic you see here on the right-hand side. It also gives us the value of the test statistic. Remember that we still need to show our work and plugging into that formula. It also gives us a p-value. We can see that our p-value is very small on that right-hand side probability, and our degrees of freedom is also uh, given to us if we do the, instead of the draw command, if we do the calculate command, but degrees of freedom is just one less than the sample size, so it's also very easy to figure out. We know that three and a half standard deviations away from the center is is far away, so that's giving us, and we can see why that gives us that very, very small p-value. So that leads us to the conclude part, where we compare our alpha and our p-value. In this case, our p-value is smaller than our alpha that we selected of 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis saying that the difference is zero. We have convincing evidence that the true mean difference, placebo minus caffeine, in depression score is positive for subjects like these. This is really good evidence of why I need my morning cup of tea. Okay, using tests wisely. This is much more than just going through the mechanics of running the significance test. We want to be able to really be careful when we're interpreting significance text, tests in context. We want to, if you remember back in section two, we talked a lot about the type one and type two errors. We want to be able to have a really good understanding of those and what the consequences of each one might be so that we can avoid the worst consequences as needed. What also comes into play here is selecting an appropriate sample size and uh, uh, selecting an appropriate significance level. So how large a sample do I need? We know that a smaller significance level, for example, a 0.01 instead of a 0.05, requires stronger evidence or more extreme sample statistic value to reject the null hypothesis. Higher power, remember power that we talked about, as the, the ability of the test to correctly reject a false null hypothesis. Higher power gives a better chance of detecting a difference when it really exists, like in the potato chip example. And at any significance level and any desired power, detecting a small difference between the null hypothesis and the alternative parameter values requires a larger sample than detecting a large difference. So what that means is, almost no matter what your problem is, having a higher sample value, a sample size, is going to solve the problem. With larger sample sizes, our significance test is going to be able to give us more information because the larger sample sizes are going to be able to detect small deviations from the null hypothesis more easily. Beware of multiple analyses. Statistical significance ought to mean that you found a difference that you were looking for. So this means a specific value that we're testing. The reasoning behind statistical significance works well if you decide what difference you're seeking, design a study, 
to search for it and then use a significance test to weigh the evidence we get from a sample. In other settings, significance may have little meaning. I know that this was a jam-packed chapter of information. We have hit every one of our learning objectives for 9.3, but of course, watching a video like this one does not mean that you don't need to go back to your textbook and read the specifics and the details and look at the examples. Once you do that, you're ready to start your homework problems and start running those statistical tests, significance tests for population mean. See you back in class.